that's gonna have some fun and talk to everyone. I promise it's a fun thing to do. Let's grab ourselves a class and talk it up our ass. It's time for me to have a beer with you. Come on. <laughs> what up, bro? It's good. Happening. What's what's going on? This is beers with engineers. Hi. What you sipping on? What you got over there? I got some Devil's Backbone Vienna Lager because I am not the biggest um, craft beer drinker. But that's still like that's kind of heavy, isn't it? I mean, here, take a sip. All right, all right. it's uh, it's no, it's lighter. I mean, it's it's heavier than like a light beer, but yeah, yeah, it is much. That's lighter not like than an most. actual. Like IPAs or stuff. Light beer. Um, and it's it's not necessarily a craft brewery anymore because they got bought by Anheuser Busch. Oh, did they? Yeah, that's pretty. But dumb. they are from uh, Nelson County, Virginia. Hey, Virginia boys. Yeah. Um, well, that's sweet. And now that's sort of like your go-to now, right? Oh yeah. I mean, if I'm not drinking bourbon. True. Okay, <laughs> between beer and. Uh, like whiskey, bourbon. That. What, what's the preference? You, you go for the liquor over the beer. Yeah, I tend to go for bourbon for a couple of reasons. One, it takes less to get the job done. Um, <laughs> but two, it's like a, it's a different type of drunk. Yeah. Like if, if or like even a buzz. Like you know, if you're just maintaining like a steady dull buzz. Um, with beer, it's like you have to drink you know four, five, six beers to get the buzz and then to like start maintaining it. And then there's like all this, it gives me gas. It makes you have to pee, like (laughs) all sorts of stuff. But with bourbon, it's just kind of like, you know, you take a few shots, drink a mixed drink. Like I, I have a tradition whenever I buy a new bottle that I haven't had before. I drink a little bit of it neat. And then if it's really good, I might have, you know, a couple of, a couple of glasses neat and then start mixing it. I tend to mix it with Coke, but right. Um, you know, drink a few of those and get you feeling right. All right. So we also bought when we were at the store, this cut water, lime ranch water, ranch water, uh, made with award winning real spirits. I got to rotate the can most awarded can cocktails, USA. You said there's tequila in this? Yeah. Apparently. Oh, no. I didn't know that. Uh, oh, where'd you see that? Real tequila, 100% ranch water. That's really cool. Now, so this, like you said, this is sort of a truly, we both tried it. Yeah. Kind of the lighter. Kind of the, kind of a, one of the, like, uh, flavored seltzer drinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's so, the thing I was going to say for the pod until now was uh, it's kind of funny because I remember coming up being a slightly underage, you know, experimental with alcohol, where if you said, hey, I had a Mike's Hard, everyone would be like, oh, you had a sissy drink. Ooh, Mike's Hard. Yeah. But now the whole, like, light tasting alcohol like seltzer the seltzer stuff now mike's wasn't seltzer was no, it it was like a lemonade it was like a mike's yeah was like a hard lemonade drink. but the sort of like lighter alcohol stuff yeah. is is become the thing in fact i think i saw someone driving on the way home yesterday with a truly in their hand hell yeah not responsible whoever you are seek jesus hey man friday is Rules don't apply on Fridays. <laughs> well, it, it applies because this person, one, held a can that looked like a Truly. Don't know if it actually was. Yeah, but I mean, like a Diet Coke looks like a Coors Light. So uh, it Okay. But I'm like, okay, this person was not paying attention. Fair. I was like, they better not rear end me in my new car because I'm going to be pissed. Uh, yeah. And uh, not only that, they went from drinking to, oh, man, Queen the sunlight looks fantastic on you. I don't know what the kids say nowadays, but in my mind, she's like, damn, this sunlight looks great on me right now. So she went to go take selfies. I mean, yeah, that's extra all, stupid. While, all while behind me. And I'm like, girl, please seek Jesus. Cause you need help right now. And please don't hit my car. She did. She let Jesus take the wheel. I apparently, uh, so we're saving that ranch water for, uh, your wife when she shows up. Yeah. 
Like, um, get her to try it. It's definitely her speed. She likes yeah. the Trulies and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I also picked up this High Pitch Mosaic IPA. IPA dry hopped with Mosaic and Centennial. It claims to be Hoppy and Tropical by High Wire Brewing. Brewing. Sure. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of words to talk like. Oh, there's more words on the can. Well, so, okay. All right. A balanced Western North Carolina IPA with bright citrus and tropical fruit aromas. Expect big grapefruit, tangerine, and subtle lemon flavors from the chorus of mosaic and centennial hops to balance out the malt in this dank and drinkable ale. So what's the percentage on that? Uh, oh, shit. I <laughs> spilled some on me just now, so it's a little bit less now. No, it's actually not. Uh, 6.7 alcohol by volume. I'm pretty sure that ranch water is like 5.9 and tastes a whole lot less like ass. Yeah, it's 5.9, the ranch water. It tastes better. Um, It's different, It's so it's not direct comparable. But sure, and I'm not a huge IPA guy. I don't think. I mean, I, mean, I know I'm not. I think I tend, and I haven't had enough beer, uh, enough variety to really know to understand what I'm drinking. I haven't gotten the beer lessons yet. Um, I think I go for more ales, and then I definitely like a good stout or porter, like sure. really dark stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I basically stop at like a lager because I'm. Just weak, I guess. I don't know. My, no, it's not a weak it's preference. The, I don't have the beard strength of the other hipsters that drink craft beer. Well, I don't have the strength of the bourbon that you drink. I mean, like, so like, one thing I was going to mention was there's a, I don't want to call it a theory, but there's a, okay, before like micro distilleries became a thing, there were all the big like whiskey companies, right? Mm-hmm. You had like, Jack Daniels and there's some parent company that owns Jack Daniels. There's like Jim Beam and whatever parent company owns Jim Beam. And they also own a bunch of like smaller bottles. Is it Beam or Bean? Beam with an M. I always say it Bean. (laughs) B-E-A-M like macho. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, But you know, these, these like big um, worldwide bourbon manufacturers, they, uh, basically there's only like four bourbons in the world and every, every bottle is some combination of those four barrels or those four like recipes. Right. So, and I mean, there's, there's exceptions to that. And especially now with like the advent or the, the, yeah, the advent of, um, like micro distilleries, like guys in their garage, you know, distilling whiskey and shit, like ain't no telling, but for a long time, it was just, you know, they would sell portions of their recipes to different companies and they would mix and match and do this and that and age it differently and whatever else. And then you'd get different bottles of whiskey. Yeah. Well, and on the beer side, I mean, micro brews have exploded. It sure. seems yeah. like, mm-hmm. I mean, even the ones local to us. It's like they start as a hole in the wall in a strip mall, mm-hmm. and then they blow up. They go get a piece of land and build their own building. I mean, it's incredible how quickly these guys blow up, and it's great stuff. Well, I think, you know, uh, I think one thing that they have to have in this day and age is the ability to market themselves. Mm-hmm. If Even if you make the greatest tasting beer on earth, if you can't market yourself, you ain't going nowhere with it. Yeah, that's where you get all the creative names. As I was saying in Kroger, it's like I'm a sucker for a good-looking label. Right. So even if it's trash beer, you at least got a sale from me if you can or your bottle looks cool. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of, dude, going like, oh, well, it'd be a huge change of uh uh, subject but like even with the record shopping that we did mm-hmm. that was one of my things is like i like good looking record covers like mm-hmm. i don't know maybe that's superficial yeah but i don't really know what i'm supposed to know about your product until i actually open it and taste it so the marketing really matters until i pick that up yep um before we get any further i do want to say thank you because we are in your studio your home studio <laughs> here 
I don't know if I'd call it a studio. I'd call it a studio. It's a f- if it's got walls and microphones, it's a studio. Fair enough. Uh, it's we just are, a corner of my garage. We're in the recording place of <coughs> your podcast that you do with your friend friend or friends. Is it just, uh, just me and John. Yeah. Okay. And it's called? The Dark Itself. Uh, yeah. What do y'all do on there? So we, we were, up until very recently, up until, I don't know when this is coming out, uh, but we started as The Dark Itself in january 23 however we started as stumbling distance music podcast in january of 2020 it's been that long yeah technically our first episode dropped december 31st 2019 nice okay yep so um it's been a hot minute and you know we love me and john are both musicians we've loved music we're both both very passionate about music uh we play in a band together also um but we you know we we felt like we had kind of pigeonholed ourselves having stumbling distance music podcast right like like now you can only talk about music or it's not going to make sense with the name and stuff sure um so we kind of revamped it a little bit. We also wanted to venture into like the world of uploading videos to YouTube as well as an audio podcast. So Sweet. we built the little little set that's behind us right now that you guys can see at our YouTube channel, uh, the dark. I think it's the dark underscore itself. Okay. Um, and you know now we talk about yes music because we still again love music and um our. Uh, kind of obsessed with music, but we also really enjoy like uh, horror movies and um, video games and art and all manner of nerdy shit. So, part of my language. Movies too, right? You know, like yeah. Movies, movies, shows, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Um, just whatever, whatever, uh, whatever tickles our fancy. I, yeah, that was the thing when kind of coming up for an idea for a podcast. It, it's like okay. We have all these kind of fun, interesting conversations in the office. And I'm like, gosh, if only people could hear stuff like this. And like, that that's where the whole beers with engineers came from. It's just like, dude, we're just, we're just having fun conversations. Let's just b- try and bottle it up a little bit and send it out there. Yeah. And, and I like, you know, we were kind of at first me and a couple of folks I was talking to about the idea. It was like, well, what is it going to be? Is it like a very regimented, like, we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about that. And I was just like, you know, that doesn't seem like what I want to do. I want something more dressed down, more nonspecific. Like, yeah, I'm an engineer, and yeah, I'll end up talking about engineering stuff. But do I want that to be the sole thing every time? Yeah, sure. Or do I want the ability to kind of branch out and talk about other stuff of interest? Like, for instance, you're not an engineer. Nope. You're my brother. I love you. Hell no. And, And... but you're not an engineer, but I don't really see engineer as like, you got to be a card carrying member. Now, as far as like actually doing engineering work, you better be, you better, you better know some stuff before you start tinkering. Um, but like, I think in the yeah, sort of my dressed job, down, my job is to piss engineers off, right? You work alongside engineers. And so you kind of get that experience of having to deal with us. Yep. Um, I mentioned on a previous podcast that like i kind of came to the engineering from the long way i came from the bottom up i didn't just pipeline straight into school and then um you know go out and be an engineer i was an electrician first did some designer work um so i worked alongside engineers but just on the sort of you know putting their info down and making sure the instruction the work instructions get down properly um and in that so I, I also said that I feel a bit like an imposter because of that. Like, I got the degree. I am an engineer. But in, in a sort of weird way, I do still kind of feel like an imposter. And maybe that's partially because it's so new. Yeah. Like, I've only I, been I'd an imagine. engineer for a few months now. Yeah. But I mean, but, like, if the if the deal is, or if your thought process is that, like, you haven't done any real engineering work yet... Like you just became an engineer, bro. Like, yeah, but like that shit will come. Yeah, it will. And, but it was also like, well, shoot, if if a podcast happens like this and it gains any form of notoriety, even amongst, you know, just a small group of friends or a small group of professionals, 
I could try and reach out to other engineers like, Hey, you know, it's not much. It's a small show, but come on and talk to me about like what you do or what you're interested in. It doesn't even have to like the, we had one podcast where the guy, he's an engineer as well, but we kind of talked about his hobbies and stuff. Like, I don't need to know like the intricate details of like, what do you work on from day to day? Yeah. It, you know, this show is, I guess, meant to be more of just like a dress down, have a beer, let your hair down, you know, just relax. And well, let's talk about whatever. And so I guess I like and appreciate that you've recognized that with your own podcast. And it's like, you know, we, there's more things to music that we thoroughly enjoy yeah. and we want to be able to branch out and talk about those things as much as possible. Exactly. And, you know, we, like I said, we play in a band together and it's a, a weird kind of, it's awesome, but it's, we, we finally consolidated a, um, or came up with a, a Spotify like a uh, bio. Yeah. And, and we wanted it to just be one sentence. Um, and we had a, a pretty difficult time kind of whittling it down to one sentence, but we finally got it. And our one sentence is, we write dumb songs about great horror stories. There you go. You know, it's kind of punk. It's kind of metal. It's kind of, you know, weird genre-wise. Kind of like, we have and a it's very big, like... it's interpretation. Sure. Like, it can move and shift, and yeah. you know, and that's okay. Uh, I think we might... There, There's a petition. I mean, we're just a three-piece, so I'm one of three members, but... um there's been a petition from one of us to change the bio to say we write aggressively mediocre songs about <laughs> great horror stories. Right. Cause you know, some, some of them are movies. Some of them are books. Some of them are video games. We, we have a song, um, about if you guys play uh dead by daylight, um, yeah, one of the game, one of the killers in dead by daylight. Uh, we have a song about her and like her kind of backstory. Okay. Um, is it like the witch lady looking one or I, no, there's so she's, many of she's them. called the huntress. Um, okay. If you like to see her, she's like, she's huge. She's like, I don't know, six, seven feet tall. And she wears like a bunny mask and runs around. In, like, oh a, yeah. Like, apron carrying an ax and shit. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's one of those games that oddly enough, it's actually pretty interesting to watch. I've never played it. Oh. But seeing people seeing people play it, it's like, oh wow, like that's kind of cool. You're going around trying to fix generators, try and turn on the power. Right. Uh there's like lights and stuff that you can kind of use to deter the enemy or, or whatever, something like that. Uh so I know the, there's like the generator pallets. the generator has lights on it. So like there's okay, so the premise is there's four survivors and one killer in every match. Yep. And the killer obviously is trying to kill the survivors. And the survivors are trying to escape. In order to escape, they have to fix like five generators. The generator has like these spotlights on it. So when you fix the generator, the spotlights come on. And that kind of alerts the killer that like, hey, there was just people there because they just fixed that generator. Right. And um, so, but there are like, so the, the survivors cannot have any weapons. Only the killers have weapons. Also, the killers run faster than the survivors. Okay. Like as a as a mechan uh, mechanism of the game. Right. The killers run faster than the survivors. However, you can um like I said, the hunters carries an axe, and there there is certain spots on every map where you can run through this narrow gap and pull like a pallet. there'll be like a pallet yeah. leading up and you can pull that down behind you and that'll slow them up. There's also um, like flashlights too, right? You can kind of blind them yeah, or something. Yeah, to a degree, but that's really difficult to do because I have played that game and I am not any good at it. And <laughs> uh, the the couple times I've played it, it has scared the hell out of me a few times. Right. I mean, and it's not like, you know, I can't go to sleep anymore because I'm terrified, but it's like just a, a startling... Because another thing about it is the the killers all make a certain noise. So like the huntress has this song that she hums uh -huh. and um, it's like this eerie little melody, but like you can, kind of like a lullaby yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. But you can hear it like clear across the map. Oh, wow. And uh, the deal is that it gets louder as they get closer to you. Sure. And, huh. so, and so like you can be hiding because the things were loud and you have no idea because you can't like really see around whatever you're hiding around. Right. And like the, 
the hunters can be like right behind you and like it's super loud and you have no idea because your camera's not faced that way and you know you just gotta hope that they didn't see you or yeah. something yeah yeah well they i think they also have ways of tracking the survivors right like, uh so like you can if, see if they hurt on the ground or something well so if they hurt you you yeah. you obviously bleed and they can track your blood okay um also uh there are certain things and it's been a hot minute since i played but there are certain things that you can do as a survivor that gives it gives the killer like a brief um it's almost like infrared and they can just see the outline of people of the survivors kind of see how far away how far away you are and like kind of a general direction but it's just for an instant it's like like two or three seconds worth of like hey they're over there you know and you could see if they're crouched or standing or yeah but by the time you get over there they're probably getting yeah different oh yeah spot, they could be gone know? but it gives you an idea to kind of start going that way yeah okay but it's a really interesting game um survival game and uh they so you wrote a song based on her her, her backstory right. her backstory is that she was uh i i don't want to screw this up but I'm going to try it anyway. Was she a butcher? No, she was a little girl that was abandoned in Russia. Okay. Um, During some war, like some fictional war, she was, she was abandoned and raised, I want to say by wolves. Okay. And so then people found her and went to rescue her and she killed all of them. Oh wow. And like fed them to her wolf family basically. Okay. And like, so she's this like, she is giant. She's like six foot something. Like she's a huge person. Kind of like wolves compared to dogs, kind of. R- right. Yeah. And but she's this like feral human and like all she wants is to like protect her wolf family and you know her human family like or like all humans be damned because they're they're the enemy that want to take her away from her family. It's nuts. Yeah. Like I, I never really knew the backstory. That's like the but... murderous George of the Jungle. Yeah, kinda. <laughs> Where Basically. like George of the Jungle was like inquisitive and curious and like you know like a cross between Tarzan and Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> like uh man, that's crazy. Yep. That's cool. But it's you know, so the the lullaby that she hums that you hear in the game, yeah. we we based our entire song around that lullaby. Like we figured it out what the notes were on guitar and like wrote like guitar riffs based on that melody and um like kind of constructed a song around it and then the very last thing you hear in that song is the actual like game audio like melody of hers right <coughs> i i still want to eventually get you on escape from tarkov cuz that's the one game like, i've heard it, a lot about it it scares me but it's for different reasons yeah like i remember the first time i bought it i was like i don't know what this game is but it looked badass some from some russian developer and i remember going into the first so it's there's a lot of lore behind it but the basic premise is that there was these quote unquote contract wars between these um there was like this laboratory doing experiments there was there was these private military groups that got into conflict with each other, and there there's all this chaos that happened. So the setting of the whole game is this Russian dystopia called Tarkov, and to play the game, uh, you go into what's called a raid. So you pick a particular part of the map, you go in there. There's quests available to do. And so the idea is that you go in, you you drop into a raid, you try and complete quests if you can, you try and loot things if you can, you try and kill enemies if you can, and then you have to escape. Whatever you bring into the raid, if you die, it gets lost to where other people can pick it up and, and exit the raid with it. Um, and so it's a very kind of high stakes thing. You You make sort of a calculation on what map are you going to, what are the dangers that are on that map? Uh, how much so am you, I willing to risk? I guess my first question is: Do you know? Do you know the map before, like before you like yeah. select the gear you want to take? Yeah. So, like one of the basic maps that people come to know, there's one called Factory. It's very small. It's all indoors. 
there's not much to it uh Mm -hmm. but there are quests on it so it's a very like and it's oh that's the other thing each raid depending on what map you go to is timed right so factory has the shortest time i think it's like 15 or 20 minutes or something like that so you need to be dropped into the raid do your quest kill enemies whatever you got to do and then get out by the end of that time or else the screen goes black and you're essentially lost to tarkov <coughs> um and then whatever like i said whatever you brought into the raid is lost right um you don't get it back and there's sort of an economy around the whole thing on trying to get there's traders that you can buy things from and stuff um so factory is one of the like early ones that people try and learn customs is another one and one of the other interesting things, customs used to be, it's expanded as a map, but it used to be very narrow kind of in the middle of the map. It'd be kind of big on either side and then really narrow in the middle. Mm-hmm. And what it was is, so where you spawn in on the map determines where you need to exit the map. Sure. So if you spawn, let's just do left and right. If you spawn on the right side of the map, you need to ex- extract from the raid on the left side of the map. Right. So early customs used to be really narrow in the middle, so it's spawning some people on the left side. It's spawning some people on the right side. And it sort of forced you into this bottleneck in the middle. Right. And so it, it was a game that really forced conflict. They've sort of since then expanded into this whole overarching idea of, well, I think eventually they want it to be all the maps are kind of combined together. Right. It's more of an open world. And with that, they've expanded some of the maps, one of them being customs. So it's a little bit easier to get from one side of the map to the other without running into players. Yeah. Um, but it's one of these things where, like, you can kind of blend into the environment because there's no, like, if you see an enemy, you're not seeing, like, a gamer tag above their head that says, yeah. oh, uh, hi, I'm so-and-so, you're just 69, seeing, 420. You're just seeing a dot. No, it, you're not even seeing a dot. I'm saying, like, the, the dot is the, the character... Like you're seeing far the character, away. and and the. I'm no. saying if the character's far away, they're real tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're up close, they're real big. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, when yeah. I said a dot. Like I don't mean a literal dot on the character. I mean like a. You're seeing this speck of a human, really far away from you. Right. And like that's it. Yeah. It's like uh like what what they call it like hardcore mode and like Call of Duty or whatever. Where yeah, there's like no names and yeah. stuff like that. No names, no like ammo counts, no like. Yep. No um, on-screen map or anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I really appreciated about the game, because, you know, I played Call of Duty growing up. That was the game to play. Played Halo before that on other friends' consoles, because our parents never let us have an Xbox. Um, <laughs> they didn't have, like, a, an objection to the Xbox. They had an objection to buying an Xbox. Yeah. We never, like, saved up an allowance to buy an Xbox. Well, I eventually did. Well, sure. But that was, I think, by the time you moved out. But yeah, um, no, I never had an Xbox. I, I was a PlayStation guy all the way. I think I ended up buying myself a 360 by the time Call of Duty Black Ops came out. Because I remember playing that game religiously. Yep. I had, but, I but, had Black Ops on um, PS3. Oh, uh, okay. Two, three, one of, the, one of the PlayStations. Right. But so one of the big differences is like, there's no, I mean, there's a bit of a HUD. Uh, your default setting is that it doesn't show up until you start getting hit with bullets. And it's like, your arm starts to get red. And, oh, by the way, here's an icon that tells you you're bleeding from every orifice of your body. Yeah. Or whatever, you know, it, there's enough to indicate that you're in danger. When a bullet whizzes by, it kind of vignettes the screen. It, 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 there's enough telling you you're absolutely in danger. Right. Um, But there's nothing telling you how many bullets in your in your gun you kind of load it up okay it's a 30 round mag i put it in but when you're in raid and i spray someone down well i wasn't sitting there counting one two three four five six seven eight nine you know as it's spraying bullets out of the gun so the there's a way to kind of check it where you can take the mag out of the gun and i guess the weight uh in your hand you get then oh you have approximately half that's approximately 15 or whatever that's one of my favorite things to do in movies is like yeah you get a pistol okay, with a you 10 get a round pi- mag like, or like a like a six shot revolver yeah. <laughs> and like they never reload and all of a sudden they've shot like 15 rounds right like how the hell i mean there's even some i thought there was one movie that almost poked or like literally poked fun at that where the pistol just just kept going 
It's Probably. Like, you know, <laughs> it's I, just how I, it is. I can't remember the name of the movie, but I, I watched I watch a lot of movies. Um, but I, I watched some movie not too long ago where they they made a big deal about saying it was a Beretta nine millimeter. Yep. And I just happened one of the dumb, stupid facts that I have lodged in my head for no good reason is that a Beretta nine millimeter is sixteen rounds stock anyway. Okay. Like you can you Plus can do one other... in the chamber, so like seventeen overall. No, I think it's sixteen overall. Okay. Um I think. I think it's a I think it's a fifteen round mag and one in the chamber makes sixteen. Okay. Um but so anyway, like they make a big point about it's a Beretta nine millimeter, blah, 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 blah. And they um, like start shooting and they have, there's this like, you know, sometimes this character has the gun and then he drops it. And then this other character has the gun and then they drop it, whatever. But like you're going through and like my, one of my favorite things to do is like, I happen to know that that gun holds 16 rounds. So I'm counting right as they're firing and like, you ought to be out of rounds. And he pulls the trigger and it fires one more time. I'm like, you suck. Right. Like, I don't know. It's just dumb little like inconsistencies like that. Well, even a beloved movie like um, Super Troopers, I think, has an inconsistency. Oh, sure. But the, Super, the Super meow Troopers scene? Was, a, was a comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the meow scene mm-hmm. where it's like, you need to get 10 meow- meows to uh-huh. beat the record or whatever. And he's sitting there showing him nine fingers. Right. Like, oh, you need one more. And he just goes back to the one and goes, meow. I think there's, he's either short one or he's over one. Oh, and okay. you go back and look at that scene. Gotcha. There's something like that. But yeah, Tarkov, just to go back to it, is like, it's such a brutal game. Mm-hmm. So it's not built as a horror game. Yeah. But it, it's such a like, when you die in the game, there's no kill cam. You don't get to see where the guy shot you from. The only thing you get to see now is you get to see what bullet hit you and where it hit you. Like what was the kill shot? Right. And and that's on a screen where you end up paying some money to heal your character back up. So you can kind of reset. Right. Um, But like, so you could be walking through the forest on a map called woods and there's, you know, higher places up on rocks where people can snipe from. And you're thinking you're kind of in the brush. You're kind of safe. No one can really see you. And then someone cracks a shot and lands it on your head. And it's just like lights go out. You see the camera kind of go down to the floor. There's a bit of like a gong kind of sound that right. tells you you're done. And, uh, you know, you just see everything go to black. You get a little bit of sound after that. That's like you hear footsteps or maybe it's enough to kind of hear like what direction the sound came from. Yeah. And that's all you can really tell your friend. I got shot from the left. Sounds pretty far. Like yeah. that's all the info. You know, if you're playing with friends and you're in a voice chat or something. Well, so like when you're, oh, uh, you have to be in like a separate voice chat. Yeah. Like if you're on discord or something, some, sure, sure, sure. You know, team speak or, but like, it'd be really interesting if the game had like an audio option like that. So they just it, added that in. There is VoIP now. Sure. But like if, um, if you die, then your mic goes dead, basically, like in game. That'd be a cool option. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, as hardcore it's, as that game actually is, like, okay, once you die, you can no longer talk to your teammates. Yeah, I mean, that, but that just gets circumvented by you have going, yeah, sure, a going secondary to Discord software, or, or yeah. software or whatever. So, I mean, yeah. I've kind of thought about that too. I think it's okay not having a kill cam, but there are times where you get someone that kills you and in their name, it says TTV. So you know that they're a Twitch streamer, right? Now there are some cheaters that put TTV in their name just to troll you, but there are actually times where I've gotten killed by a TTV name. And I'm like, well, I'm dead. Let's go look at Twitch. Oh yeah, they are live. And the buddy that's still in raid. I'm like, yeah, he's over here. No, a little bit to your left. (laughs) Yeah, just uh, throw a grenade at that rock over there. And yeah. <laughs> okay. Whoosh, and they're like, oh, I'm dead. How do you know? It's like, well, you're streaming, dude. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. You kill people. You don't, And you have TTV in your name. I'm not going to come to watch and be like, oh, man, this guy's cool. I wonder, is that is that like a thing that Twitch makes them do? No. Like, like you have to put TTV no. in your name? Oh. No, not in the game. No, people will put that in their gamer tags and stuff so they know, hey, come watch me. Oh, right. Or like, hey, you just got shit on, so I must be good. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, come watch a real guy play. 
whatever. Like, See, that was the that was the thing that, in my opinion, and I I'm sure this is not going to win me any points on the internet, but in my opinion, that is what ruined a game like Among Us. Yeah, Among Us, I thought when it first came out was a fucking fantastic game. Pardon my language. Yep, like it was it was a great game. You're pardoned, by the way. Of you know, imposters versus um versus not imposters. Or, the yeah, crew the crew. Mates, yeah. Um, and you know you had to do these tasks, and then there was this whole like trial by trial by peers kind of deal yep. where, you know, you find a dead body and then all of a sudden you're all thrust into this chat and it's like, okay, who saw what? Nobody saw anything. Yeah. This guy was acting a little suspicious. What were you up like, to? Oh, yeah, I was yeah. fixing the wires. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like I thought among us was really, really cool. And then you get these Twitch streamers in there now and uh, for a while now, but um, you get these Twitch streamers, and I, I have to assume they're they're either Twitch streamers or they're hackers or right. something. But they'll get in there and, you know, they're not trying to do or they're not trying to complete tasks if they're one of the crew. They're not trying to kill anybody if they're, they're trying an to be imposter. They're, yeah, they're just trying to entertain some, like, audience that we can't see. Right. It's like, what are you even doing yeah. right now? You know? So I just, I haven't played Among Us in a hot minute, but yeah, I used to love that game. I played it. It started to get some notoriety from a, a Twitch streamer that I was watching. And I was like, oh, that actually looks really fun. Let's go play that. But you're right. After a while, it's like, you'll you'll be in a game. And it's like, dude, we have two tasks left. Who's not doing their tasks? Right. And you're like kind of freaking out. Like, what the heck, dude? Like, and, either play the game or don't. Yeah. You know, like if you want to do that kind of crap, there's like, you can set up a private party. Yeah. Yep. And and go have a blast, but you know they want to they want to shit on like unsus unsuspecting people on the internet or whatever. It's like now you're just a dick. Well, the other thing that's sort of amazing about Twitch and the gaming industry is that like it's sort of amazing to see how much a prominent streamer can change the dynamic of a whole game. Sure. One of the key examples that I would bring up for that is Ninja. When he when he started getting notoriety, kind of when Fortnite was really hitting its rise. Now, I never really played Fortnite, but obviously it was a very extremely popular game. Still is, to my knowledge. Uh, and it got a crap ton of notoriety. Sure. Um, and honestly, even not playing the game, watching someone like Ninja play the game was kind of mesmerizing. And because at first it's like, yeah, building in the battle royale stuff was a mechanic, but people didn't really know how to use building walls and ramps as a defense. Yeah. People just would kind of like stand on a hill like, OK, I'll, I'll try and shoot this guy. But Ninja comes along and he'll rapidly build a house around himself and start taking pot shots you know, edit a window for himself, shoot at the guy and then edit the window out. And the guy can't get him anymore. Right. And that changed up the whole dynamic to now the whole meme is someone will build a giant tower. The moment he sees one guy and go through all this effort just to get a couple of shots on him. Right. It, it just changed up the whole dynamic to the point. I think now Fortnite has taken building out of the battle royale and gone back to like bare bones. Good. <laughs> it's like but even even in the tarkov realm the prominent streamers for tarkov all it takes for them to say this part of the game is stupid or they should really improve this or maybe they should think about this being a feature and enough people get behind it just kind of from public consensus that that the developers are talking about well yeah we're working on this now <coughs> to now be in the game because we're we're hearing you or we're trying to pay right. attention to what you guys want and see, I don't know, I don't know how hardly anything about Tarkov, except for what I hear from like you, and I, I pretty religiously watch unsubscribe podcast. Yeah, and one of the guys on unsubscribe podcast Batty. is Batty Streams, yep. and he's huge into Tarkov, and so huge at one point his beard was a thing you could buy in the game. It still is. Okay, I, I don't know. It's a facial eye because there's like face coverings and stuff. Right. So you can have like a baklava or like a, you know, a bandana as a face mask. 
So his red beard is a thing you can put up in lieu of that. And so your guy, like they put a Santa Claus beard was sort of the same thing. Sure. During Christmas, uh, they put a Santa Claus beard. And also, so that, it's called a balaclava. What did I say? I don't know. Baklava? It wasn't that. Yeah. Balaclava? There's baklava, which is a dessert. <laughs> and then there's balaclava, which one is of a those face things. recovery. Put some dessert on your face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm getting to the the near end. I've been kind of babysitting it, but I'm getting to the bottom of this beer. Uh-oh. Getting hammered, you boys. Know, you know what that means? Getting hammered. We're getting, we're getting slushy up in this place. So do you have... Okay, you work... We'll bring engineering into this a little bit. You work alongside engineers. Like yes. I said, you're not, yes, you're not an actual card-carrying member. No, the fuck I'm not. But you work alongside them on a daily basis. I was kind of curious, because you're my brother, and you're honest with me, and I love you. What are some of your gripes when it comes to engineers? Lord. Um... I got to say my biggest gripe, uh, if there was one thing that I could just hit a button and fix about every engineer on the planet, not every engineer on the planet. That's most little, engineers. That's a little extreme, but most of the engineers I work around constantly, they all have this, this holier than thou complex because they have a piece of paper that says engineering on it. Hey, I have one of those. Yeah. And I don't, <laughs> um, but the one thing they seem to forget, and I mean, obviously you don't apply to this, but um, the one thing they seem to forget is that, like, I have trades experience. And yeah. They don't. Yep. They went to Virginia Tech or, or some other, like, you know, great, great college, and they got a very difficult degree, and they know a lot of stuff on paper. Yep. In ideal world situations. And I'm here to tell you that the the real um trades world is anything but ideal. Yeah. And so, you know, we got I get into to arguments with engineers constantly that are going, you know, well well this dictates that and so therefore that and this and you know, dude, shut up. That's not the way it works in in real life. Yeah. You know, uh, just to bring up the the slightest example. Um one of the classes I did, I have a business degree, <laughs> right? But one of the classes I did take in college was strengths and materials. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really odd that a lot of the, um, a lot of the problems we worked through disregarded friction, completely disregarded friction. Eventually we did wind up like putting friction, the coefficient of friction in. Right. But you know, completely disregard friction, friction for now. Freaking why? Friction is a thing. It happens. Yeah. It's like disregarding gravity. Like, why would you do that? Yeah, it's just like all the physics classes we took. Or, I mean, I didn't take a or like bunch. Because I'm electrical engineering. I'm not uh, mechanical. But like, you Disregard know, air resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> well, shut up, watch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, yeah, it. It's like, well, it's negligible in most learning cases. But I right, understand. once you approach the real world, it's like if I started to try and work at SpaceX and they're like, yeah, ignore error resistance. And it's like, uh, what? Yeah. Wait, that's how I did it in school. Exactly. It's like, well, no, we need to, <laughs> we I, need to keep am... in mind that there's air, there's differences in pressure, there's wind, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff. So that's, but I, I've literally seen emails before where people like uh like makeup supervisors on the engineering side are sending emails to our planning side and they're going um I just need you to trust us on this because generally speaking our our group is a little better educated than your group. Oh nice. It's like <laughs> yeah, how about you piss off? Yeah. <laughs> what I, I, kind of little brat are you to to say something like that to somebody else? Everybody has a, a reason why they got hired. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a great reason. I understand. But like, how much trades experience do you have in the engineering side? I know one that I work with that has prior trades experience. Well, like versus I know at bare minimum five to 10, including myself on the planning side that have 
right trades experience and and we work at the same place and i also have as i've mentioned before trades experience as an electrician and it's i haven't said where we work but um it's it's kind of amazing how little even the overarching company values the trade experience when someone goes up to the higher position sure. it's talking about ignoring things yeah they almost ignore that yeah because part of the decision to like okay I've, I've gotten my degree it's time to step up from a designer who's doing the autocad stuff and other you know databasing kind of things to help support <coughs> engineers now it's time for me to be an engineer sure um you know got my degree time to apply get contacted by one of the whatever talent agent whatever hr people and uh they're like yeah now here's the pay we were thinking and i was like oof that sounds pretty low well well you just got your degree right well yeah that's true but i also have 10 years at this company right and they're like well i understand that you know i'll go back and look at the numbers they go back and look at the numbers and you could tell that the lady was kind of reading from a script yeah and obviously if they're a low enough employee in that branch they can't deviate from the script too much so i don't blame the person (laughs) That's just sort of what they're given. And more than likely, most of the time, it's like, here's the pay. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Bye. And, you know, that's the end of the conversation. But I was like, God, that seems a bit low. Well, like one thing I... Well, just let me me finish this one. Fair enough. Um, And so they call back and they're like, yeah, you know, the offer doesn't change. I was like, well, that's a bit twisted. And I got talking to my boss and stuff like, listen, I might have to decline this on principle. Yeah. That you're not valuing any of the prior experience. And the lady, I think, made a mistake or an error because she says, well, you know, you just got your degree. Can you admit to that? I was like, yeah, like, I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing I have a wealth of experience from the ground up that's valuable in the engineering space. Yeah. And she goes, well, we're looking at you as if, you know, you're a recent college grad that did an internship or a co-op. No. And I'm like, no, that like, is incorrect. I'm like, well, hold on. So now I didn't say this on the phone with her, but when we, I said, well, look, I'm, I'm not going to accept the offer. Um, you know, we'll just try and work something out at this point. Sure. Cause I'm not accepting it as is. And I went to my boss. I was like, that's insane. You're taking my 10 years of experience in trades and in design working alongside engineers and flushing it down the toilet and equating it to a guy that showed up to a summer or two right to help out wherever the department told him to yep it's like that's insane that's nuts right and And see the thing to me is there's this whole whole ethos of well, we work for the trades. The trades are our customer. They're the most important. And that's true. I yeah. firmly believe that. Yeah. But so there was a, there was a, an issue recently where they they want to prototype this stuff, uh this this new way of doing things uh-huh. uh in in order to better support the trades people like a stuff. new process, a new product, new product. Right. Okay. Uh, a new type of product that we create in order to better support the trades. Got it. Got it. And um, so they want they want to prototype it, and we had this this one kickoff meeting for it not that long ago, and so it was the first time that I think anybody from the trades had ever been to our building. So there's this. Um, there was a lead general foreman, a general foreman, and two foremen that showed up, mm-hmm. and from from a specific trade, and they go, "Hey, they were they were pipe fitters." And they go, hey, uh, before this meeting kicks off, and there was there was me and a couple, my boss and a couple other people from the planning side, yep. and then there were a handful of people from the engineering side, and the lead general foreman goes, before we start this, could I ask a question? Of course, go ahead. How many of y'all have trades experience? Yep. And I was the only one to raise my hand. <laughs> and he goes, have you ever walked on... Or have you ever worked on a thing before? Like, yep. yeah. He's like, how many have you worked on? Like, worked on? I've worked on two. I've been on like four or five. 
he's like, okay, I just was curious. Yep. And, you know, he went on to explain his point. He's like, do you know how many pipe fitters we have in this particular project? Like, no. Like, 170. Damn, that seems low. Yeah. He's like, do you know how many out of that 170 have better than 10 years experience? Seven. Yeah. And so his whole point is, you know, we got a bunch of guys down there, guys and girls down there that, uh, you know, can't even change our own oil. Yep. And we're asking them to do this, this really difficult stuff all the time. Yep. And they don't know how it's not like you can, I mean, half of them have a difficult time reading a tape measure. Yep. It's uh, so, I mean, I sympathize. I do. Yeah. But at the same time, there's there's budgetary constraints. There's all sorts of other crap that you know we may or may not have. And well, they're seeing that as a management slash engineering problem in itself. Sure. That I agree that it's a management problem. The workforce is getting younger. They're less experienced. Yep. And there's, I mean, I remember. So we work at a shipyard. I'm not gonna say where. There's plenty around. Take a guess. Um. When we came in, or when I came in, I don't know if they did this with you, they said, here's a graph. And the graph was a reverse bell curve, mm-hmm. where it's really tall on the on the ends of the graph and really shallow in the middle. Mm-hmm. And so, and that was to point out that, like, okay, from ages 18 to maybe 30, there's a lot of people. Or no, no, no. Uh, People, I think it was years of experience. So from people with zero to five years experience, there is a ton of people. And then on the like 30 to 40 years experience, there's a ton of people. Right. There's like no one in the middle with the 15, 20 years experience. Right. Now that was when I came in 11 years ago. Yeah. Now that and, they never did that with us, but they, they did tell us all sorts of statistics and stuff about, you know, People, the, the people who have been here for even 20, 30, 40 years plus are leaving in droves. Yeah. And you guys are the ones who are going to replace them. And they're, and they're seriously looking at us like, you need to pick up the slack. Okay, what does that require? Okay, you need to learn and learn quick. Okay, if I prove that I can learn quick, does that give me more pay? Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, 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 hold on. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm not saying I'm a rock star in your organization, but I'm pretty darn good at what I do. And see, we had this, we had this uh, meeting the other day where it was kind of a, kind of a airing of grievances and a, a <laughs> yeah. it really was, it was, yeah. it was a festivus for the rest of us. And uh, <laughs> there was, there, there was a literal, a, a literal airing of grievances and. Uh, we had to work through this list of like, okay, well, what things would you change? What things do you think we could do better? And a lot of our, um, a lot of our gripes were, you know, inconsistent information coming into our organization. Yep. Um, they were they were uh, tool issues for us a lot of times. They they were things that were beyond our control. Yep. And we wound up getting down into like, hey. What are some things that are within your control that you can work on? And um, I forgot. I lost where I was going with that. What were we talking about? Well, we were talking about. uh, uh, Well, here, ruminate on that. Okay. I remember a meeting I had where I was still a designer, but in an engineering group and like, Sort of the stuff that you work on now. I got it. You got it. Go for yeah. it. So <clears throat> one of the one of the gripes that came up was like we're getting more and more responsibility and not more and more pay. And as as a general sentiment, I I get it. I I agree with that. However, I kind of have this this philosophy that you know, every day you come to work, regardless of what your job is, you should be going above and beyond. Sure. Right. So. If you go above and beyond for, you know, okay, let's say, quote unquote, above and beyond is baseline. Uh huh. Okay. Now, from that baseline, if you're asked to go above and beyond that for a day, you do not deserve a raise. Yeah. If, um, you, if, if you're, 
Go for it. You following okay. me? Do you say that one more time. So if general above and beyond is the baseline. Okay, so you're not just doing your job description. You're doing your job description and plus... a little more. Plus an increment more. Right. Okay. Okay. So now, if you're asked to do two increments more than your job description for a day... You get an increase in increment in pay. No. You do not deserve a raise oh. for one day's worth of two increments more than your job. Oh, okay. I gotcha. Okay. So now, if you are doing two increments more for a week... You do not deserve a raise. A month, you can start talking about it. Yeah. Six months, you better be having that conversation. Yeah. Or when a they year, cr- if they haven't given you a raise by that point, you need to leave. Yeah. Well, or if they crank up the dial five increments, and you're like, "Yo, boss, yeah, for um, real." Either this comes with nice overtime, or you know, well, I'm willing to put more hours in to yeah. get good money out, or the base pay needs to go up if I'm not allowed to work sure. past 40 hours in a week or something. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's just my, my own like personal work ethic, I guess. Like yeah. I, I think that no matter what my job is, I should be going above and beyond. I should be striving above and beyond. I'm not going to say I get there every single day, but I yeah. should be striving above and beyond. If my production goal is five things a week, I should be striving for six. And I should be hitting six on a regular basis. And that is how you wind up earning yourself a raise. Yeah. Well, my gripe with the organization through a lot of this stuff, through surveys, through meetings, through all that sort of stuff, I get that there's some overarching uh, changes that are happening to where it's like, okay, we can't go to every lower complaint and fix all those. We're kind of, we're fixing some big stuff right now. Yeah. So people need to kind of chill out. A tiered like a priority list yeah yeah, yeah. but shoot now i lost my train of thought. i'm sorry um you're saying they couldn't they couldn't fix every like lower level gripe yeah yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. implementing large overarching changes but they can't oh my big gripe with the organization <coughs> through these surveys and meetings and stuff is they don't and i'm not saying on a complete individual level like, I'm not expecting the HR department to know this. But even on a sort of higher management level, people don't know who the key players are. They know it on a department level. What departments need to be involved? Okay, we understand that. Who are the key players in the departments that are actually moving the work forward? It's not your managers. Yeah. They're they're bringing people to the table. They're trying to... Uh, you know, make their case for certain uh, certain resources or certain, you know, budget or something like that, you know, they're still have an important role. But I'm talking about your engineers, your planners, your designers, your who in your actual department is moving the ball forward. Because that's my sort of gripe is shipbuilding is a longer term project. Yeah. You know, it it didn't used to be that way, but it is now. It, yeah. Well, I mean, we, it, yes, true. But so it's a lot longer. And unfortunately, the organization we work for will hire folks just to fill seats. And if they don't get trained properly, they'll just sort of sit in their seat and wait until work hits them in the face. And, oh, I guess I got to do something. Right. It's like, no, dude, there's tons of work to do. Mm hmm. And yeah, it's it's probably bad on your manager or your coworkers for not shoveling work in your face to keep you busy. But, you know, you can't just sit back. Like Right. We need to be hi- at the minimum, we need to be hiring people that go, "Where can I step in?" Sure. I don't really know what's going on. Where can I help? Initiative. Yeah, initiative. Like and and it's amazing how many people on my floor on at least on the surface level don't show initiative. Yeah. I I could point you out probably 10 people on my floor that I would, if I had the power to Thanos snap them out of the organization, I would, because I don't know what you do. Yeah. I see you walking around all the time. I see you BSing with people. I don't know who you are by name or anything. I don't know what department you're in, but what what value do you add to the organization? Mercy, man. Like, what do you do? Because I, anytime I got to go take a a piss, I see you. Yep. And run in your mouth or. You know, talk about the football game right. or and it's like look and listen. Or like the thing I really hate is when people go and like ask questions 
for clarity, quote unquote. But it's like, you should know this. Yeah. Air quotes you can see from space. Yeah. Air quotes generate their own wind current for clarity. <laughs> like, dude, what? I mean, I. Well, I had a thing with another engineering group where they're like, I put out a brief saying, hey, here's this big job coming up. Here's things we need to look out for. Sure. Here's things that we need to account for. I don't know what's all going on in your systems that interface, but you know, here's here's things you need to start looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, one of them goes, "Yeah, uh, where is this happening?" As far as like the overarching project and stuff. Uh -huh. And um, I'm like, dude, my brief. If you would have put your eyes like one line down, yeah, you would know the answer to that question. Yep. Yeah, I, I hate stuff like that. And but you know, I don't want to be a rude guy. So I put it in the email like, hey, here's a short list. It was right below on that same slide or, or on that same same PDF or whatever. Yeah. On the brief, like the answer was there in front of your face. Yep. Why did you, you not didn't read even it? bother to read it? And you little shit. But, you know, so I have my own gripes and and I think our gripes kind of line up together because we did come from a more bottom up career. uh lot you know like we, right. have, we do have nice office jobs now we're part of you know it, it's good like especially being in our 30s now like you know being able to transition to a nice office job oh yeah that's a blessing not being out in the cold rain and heat and although i people <laughs> look at me like i'm crazy when i tell them like there are certain days where our tool issues are really bad or uh, you know, our server goes down or some craziness happens where we're just stuck at the office for eight hours and can't do anything. Yeah. Cause the and I tell them something. Yeah. Like we had one day where literally, uh, or allegedly, uh, what happened was a car drove into the, the building that houses a lot of our servers, the boat, the front fell off of the ship. Yeah. And so anyway, when stuff like that happens, and we're just stuck at the office for eight hours and we can't do anything. You know, we're, we're sitting there and I say, I'll say something to the effect of like, yeah, I wish I were back in the trades. <laughs> and they're like, really? How can you say that? Like, at least I had something to do there. Like it, you know, it's 70 and sunny outside today. And yeah. you know, here we are stuck in this dungeon on a computer that's not doing anything for eight hours. Yeah. Oh, and we're not allowed to be on our phones. Oh, and you know, we have to have all this like tiptoeing around each other, which is my favorite thing about the trades. You know, th there's no, um, it's very, blunt. there's, there's no, yeah, exactly. It's extremely blunt <laughs> and it's very simple. And you know, exactly what everybody you work around thinks of you all the time. Yeah. There's, I there's no tiptoeing around each other or any crap like that. You know exactly what those people think of you, and they know exactly what you think of them. Well, I hear it's getting a little bit softer. Oh, yeah. Down on the trade kindler, too. gentler shipyard. Yeah, exactly. I've heard some seasoned guys talk about it that way. They're like, yeah, we're now a kindler, gentler shipyard. Yep. And it's like, well. Which is a travesty. Some Like, you need to be, you don't need to be a tyrant, but you need to get the point across, too. If things are messed up, it needs to be said. If if someone's not doing something right and it's causing issues down the line, it needs to be said. Yep. But so I don't like politeness when it gets in the <coughs> way of getting things done. So here's here's one of my favorite stories from when I was in the trades. Just to throw this out there. Okay. About the regarding the the beautiful simplicity of the mindset of people in the trades. Yep. I worked on an aircraft carrier. For a while and we were on the catapult team and we had this this repeating job every single day where we had to go out and do the same thing every day for many many days in the catapults and so like a repetitive task that had to go throughout the whole project kind exactly. of thing like yeah it's not you're doing the same thing over and over again to no avail it's it's, no, you are making progress, but it's going to take you months. Right, right, right. It's sort of like the a small, the same repetitive task within a larger job sort right, of thing. Right, exactly. So we're doing the same thing every day. It's the middle of summer. It's like mid-June. So you're in a it's, frying pan. Yeah, it's 100 degrees outside. The They have a... <laughs> my favorite thing about the catapult sheds is they have a little 
a thermometer next to every door. Yeah. Like a just an analog just thermometer. Just to tell you how miserable you are. Yeah. At bare minimum, it's like 120 degrees in there every single day. Because <laughs> it's steel above you, it's steel below you, it's steel surrounding you, anytime and it's you like 100 rest, degrees outside. Yeah, anytime you want to rest, you're leaning or sitting on steel. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's 120 degrees in here. You are covered head to toe because you're doing hot work. You're covered head to toe in protective gear, including like a face mask and a, a freaking hood thing and like coveralls, long sleeves and the whole nine yards. And it's miserable. Well, we had this one guy. Sorry, let me back up. I joined this crew um, and the day I joined, they had hit or they were coming up on like 3000 days accident free. Nice. I mean, they were they were ex- they were a very good team, and they looked out for each other, and they worked very safely. <coughs> and um, they they just they were on their crap, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were they were making plans for when they hit three thousand days accident free. the The whole management structure was going to do something big for them, and going to recognize that that huge achievement. And uh, cause you know, shipbuilding is dangerous work. Yep. Well, we had this guy join the team shortly after me and he was a temp worker. Oh no. And he seemed to be, you know, he said he had experience. I, I was a machinist. He said he had experience as a machinist and, you know, um, had like, he seemed like he was going to work out great. And then we noticed that he wore the same pair of pants every day for a week. Mm-hmm. In the middle of summer in this cat trough. And he wore the same pair of pants every day for a week. And then the next week, same pair of pants every day for not the same pair of pants both weeks. But every week when he came, like every Monday, he would come in in a pair of pants. We knew that on Friday he'd be wearing that same pair of pants. Oh, no. And so there was one day where like 90 percent of our crew had training up to and including our foreman and general foreman mm-hmm. all had training. And um, that dude did not have training. He he was on the deck plate that day. <coughs> and he went to a different general foreman. Mm-hmm. So our crew, what was left of us, was under a different foreman and under a different general foreman that day because neither our foreman or general foreman were there. He went to a different general foreman and complained of a heat rash on his leg. Mm -hmm. And the general foreman, not knowing anything about the guy, went, what do you want to do about it? Do you want to go to the clinic? And so the guy went to the clinic. And apparently, when the clinic offered him like an itch cream, as as, as soon as they offered it to him and he accepted it, it became a recordable injury. Oh, yeah. And so here we were as a crew. Now, I was not responsible for this in any way. I had been in the crew like a month or two. Yeah. But the crew is sitting here at like 2,900 days accident free or some shit. And this guy gets a recordable injury for a heat rash. And so we come back the next day, none the wiser. None of us knew because we were all in training. And our foreman comes in at like 645 in the morning. And before the other guy showed up and he's telling the few of us that are there and he's like, Hey, I I just want you guys to know that we lost our accident total. (laughs) And we were like, what, what? (laughs) None of us were here yesterday. What do you mean? And he told us what happened. And it was like the like statistically least accident prone day. Right. There's like, there were only like three people from our crew at, on the deck plates that day. Right. And you know, here we got an accident and, and now 2,900 days goes all the way back to zero. And it was like, what? Like we were furious. Yeah. And so he leaves for a second and he comes back at seven o'clock and he's a temp worker. (laughs) Right. So supervisor leaves for a second and he comes back at seven o'clock and tries to just start the day. Like nothing happened. And all of us, I mean, the guy is sitting right right there in front of us. Every single person in that room demanded that the supervisor fire him in front Jeez of him. Jesus Christ. Like, you need to fire this man right now. 
<laughs> right now. Like, we're not going to work until you fire him. Like, Jeez. I mean, we... we Mutiny. Mutiny. I mean, not exactly. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like... Yeah. It was it was very apparent how we all felt about that guy. Yeah. In that moment. Well, dude, um the amount of time on the deck plate. I I I do get a little bit nostalgia about it. Like don't get me wrong. I do not look fondly back on working on ships when it's freezing cold, freezing rain or like it's hot as hell. Don't look fondly back on those. Sure. But I think the general like camaraderie of the people you worked with and quite honestly, being able to let off steam, like you walk in, something messes up. I don't know the, yep. the welding you were doing or the thing you put up is cattywampus or I don't know. Something messes up. You're like, God fucking damn it. And, you, yeah. and I mean, you're on a ship made of steel. You can literally throw a ball peen hammer and it's not going to hurt anything. Just don't hit a person. Don't hit a person. Yeah. And it's not, responsible to do but like you could you could go <coughs> depending on where you were you could go to a part of the ship and have a screaming fit and no mm-hmm. one would do anything no about one, it no like okay he's having a moment not not <laughs> only that but like when i get pissed off at work when i'm in the trades when i'm in a a, a, a manual labor environment yep if i get pissed off my thing that i do to let off steam is go back to work yeah. And I'm not going to talk to anybody and I do not touch me. Do not attempt to speak to me. Do not do pretend I don't exist for a while. Yeah. And let me just grit my teeth and white knuckle through, you know, I'm going to do an hour's worth of work in, in 15 minutes and just let it happen. Yeah. And like I'm, I'm, it's a good chance that I fuck something up while I'm doing that. Uh-huh. And just, if I do, I'm sorry, I'll fix it later. Like, let me go. And I'm just, I'm just going to fly through some work real quick. And then what inevitably happens is I run out of steam <laughs> and, yeah. and I go like to the bathroom or I go like, take a break for a second and breathe. And then I'm, I'm better. I can, I can come back to something with like a much clearer head. And I think you, know, you don't, you don't get that option in an office environment. No, I think that's kind of genetic to our family too. Yeah, probably. It's, it's like, <laughs> We just need to go off, blow off steam yeah. in whatever form that is. Sometimes it's just yelling. Oh, Sometimes dude. it's literally just clenching fists and seething for a while. One of my favorite things I used to do when I, when I had that uh, burn barrel that you have now. Yep. I used to get a stack of pallets. You can go burn wood. Yeah. I Well, no. My thing to do to blow off steam oh, was to crack the wood break, over a, <laughs> break apart pallets with a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's the most cathartic thing sure. ever. I mean, you're just smashing this yeah. pallet that, you know, you're not, you're not breaking anything serious. You're yeah. not hurting any, any person or like property. Like, I mean, you're going to burn it anyway. So it, it needs to be broken up. Yep. Like, so I just go smash pallets yep. and you know, it was, it was the most cathartic thing ever. Yeah. The whole, it's funny. Like I had a boss in, <laughs> in the engineering department, um, who you could just tell he has anger issues. Yeah. And the office environment does not help. Yeah, sure. But there were days where it's like, I, I called them, they were twig snapping moments. Right. Where you see him just kind of like red in the face. And I'm just imagining this little twig in his head, yeah. just going click. Yep. <laughs> and, and there'd be a couple of times where I'd say something just to make him a, like, Oh, Hey, here's another inconvenient thing that we've just had to face. Yeah. <laughs> And, just and a, that's when like the little piece of wood that's still attached to the snap twig breaks completely. Yeah. And, but, but yeah, the office environment is a totally different place where it's like people get angry. It, like this idea that like we can all manicure ourselves to be business friendly all the time. I think it's just, it's not realistically like, I yeah. think it's a nice thing to kind of shoot for, but if someone has their moment of anger, it's like, I hate how people feel like you get looked down upon because of that sure it's like and don't get me wrong the things that make you angry are different in the office environment like my <clears throat> my story kind of similar to that was like i was marking up a drawing to say what needed to be improved or what needed to be corrected da, 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 da. did that for like four 
probably around four hours, three and a half, four hours. Mm-hmm. And it was doing it on, it wasn't just p- printed out paper. It was on a PDF. So I was like editing the PDF to put markups and highlight and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And unbeknownst to me, it was, I was doing in that in one PDF editor. Someone had opened up the file using oh, a different no. PDF editor. Uh-huh. They still clicked read only like, oh yeah, sure. I'll read only. But that somehow those programs don't agree with each other. And so when I went to go save, it's like error was not able to save. Yep. And I'm like, what, what's going on? So I go to do it again. Error. Unable to save. And I'm like, what's, and I forget what I did next, but, oh, I think it was like, oh, here's the error message, you know, retry or close. And after retrying again, it gave me the same error. So I was like, well, I guess I'll close the error message and I'll do a save as to a different file name. Sure. But it closed the program. It closed the entirety of the program. Yep. Four hours gone. Love and, it. And I turned I around. Love computers. I, I literally wanted to punch the monitor. Yep. And I turn around with my fist, just like white knuckle clenched. And my coworker behind me, I was like, this fucking place, this computer. Yep. And he goes, what happened? And I kind of like explained it in a really sino- uh, like short way. He goes, well, why didn't you save the file? <laughs> And I'm like, yep. this is not the time, dude. Yep. This is not the time. The program that we work with in in my department is infamous for um just running as normal. You know, you, you go in and you're doing your thing and you'll get two, three, four hours. It depends on, you know, the size of whatever you're working on. Sometimes whatever thing you're working on could take you several days to do. Sometimes it could take you an hour. It just all depends on the size of the thing. But um, our program is infamous for on random days, it'll just not work. Mm -hmm. It'll look like it's working, but it won't work. So, you know, you'll sit in there and you'll put four, five, six, eight, hours into something and then at the very end of the day you'll you'll go to hit save and that's when the problem will rear its ugly head right. you had no idea that there was a problem that you may be you may be uh uh where the straw that broke the camel's back six hours ago you have no idea that that happened yeah but you know the 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 program has this issue and you hit save at the end of an eight hour day that you've been working on this thing for a whole eight hours. And all of a sudden you get this error message. And there are some that are, that are, it literally says fatal error message. Right. And it's just like, Oh no. (laughs) And you know, inevitably I think they've learned by now, but especially when I first started in this department, you go to your manager or your, your manager's manager and go like, Hey, I don't know what happened, but the program shut down on itself or wouldn't allow me to save or this, that, and the third thing. And they go, like you said, well, why didn't you save earlier? (laughs) Like, okay. If I should have saved earlier, you're going to tell me what that I should have saved once an hour, once every five minutes, once like, where's the line? Yeah, because because another part of that is our things our our products take between five to 15 minutes to save. So we're losing 15 minutes of the day or to average it out. We'll say 10. We're losing 10 minutes of the day just on the act of saving the thing. Right. So, okay, knowing that that takes 10 minutes by itself. How many times a day do you want me to save this? Yeah. Because if I save it three different times, I've lost half an hour in my day mm-hmm. of of productivity. So, like, how many times a day do you want me to save it? Better yet, why don't you just have programs that friggin' work? Right. Like, why, why do I have to save this 14 times a day just to make sure the work I did sticks? Yeah, I mean, and, and there's some program, like, people will probably say, like, oh, well, why don't you autosave? And, like, it sounds like that becomes really cumbersome because what you're working on is huge sometimes or just complex sometimes it it is but even the stuff that's like not as complex like i've i've turned off the autosave feature 
just because there's times where it's like, okay, I don't really know how this is going to look, but I'm going to try and do a thing to, that looks a certain way. And so I don't want to save it because God forbid it saves in the middle of me kind of moving things around yeah. and experimenting. So I turn the autosave feature off and I'm generally pretty good about saving pretty frequently, even with the less complex stuff. But there's sometimes those days where you're just rolling. You're like, we're going, we're doing, we're doing a bunch. We're checking a lot. We're, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, a bunch of done work is done. You know, you're just in the zone and then you hit that save button and just everything mm. shuts down. Yeah. Bum, bum, ba, da, wow. No. Yeah. I tell you, man. I hate that. Tell me what. What are you telling me? I don't know. They they do they do need to get the the crap figured out. But I just I think it's funny when you try and put it in the broader perspective of like what makes you in an angry in an office versus down on the waterfront. And and ultimately at the end of the day, you got paid all the same. It sucks. You're gonna have to redo the work. Um but you know, I I I think I've done a lot of work to try and not stress myself out over things like that. Sure. Even though they s- absolutely suck in the moment. Yeah. I was just like, well, yeah, well. I mean, I, yeah, I uh, I go into work every day expecting something like that to happen, which on the one hand I think is kind of tragic. Uh, you know, you you shouldn't be expecting something like that every single day that you go into work. But on the other hand, you know, I, I'm not playing those games personally. Yeah. I'm not going to play this. Well, why didn't you save game? Why didn't you save? Well, why doesn't your program work? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in the trades, if you're using a drill and the drill breaks, you go and get a new drill. Yeah. However, in the office, for whatever reason, if you're using tool. a computer, a computer program and your computer program breaks, the office or the, the IT like goes in and fix fixes your computer program and you have to use the same freshly repaired computer program. Yeah. Like, and I know that's not and like a, a lot per- of it's probably sketchy patchwork. Right. Too. Like, I know it's not a perfect analogy, but still that, well, it, to your point, when the drill breaks, your work isn't undone. Right. You still have a partially drilled hole yep. that you then just go get a new bit or new drill and then you keep going. Right. You know, with this, it's like, no, you've just gone backwards. Right. And, but I, I try and keep in mind that regardless of the day, how slow or how quickly paced it is, as long as I'm moving the progress forward, yep, at least a notch or two, like, I know some of those days it's like, okay, I basically only did my job description and I only moved it up one notch, Sure, but I can at least be proud of that. Versus other days where it's like, man, I really excelled. I really pushed the ball forward today. Yep. Good job, me. Yep. Pat on the back. You know, it's as long as I get one click of the ratchet, we're good. Yep. You know, sometimes it's just I just met my job title and expectations for the one day, fine. But, you know, in the broader scheme of things, because unfortunately, <coughs> there are people, not just in our workforce, but in workforces across the country and across the world where, they're able to show up and not do a, a damn thing. Yep. And they get paid the same and they go back home thinking, oh, yeah, I got paid. And it's like, well, what did you do? Yeah. How can you feel proud of that? Yep. I hope that every single one, I hope two things for every single one of those people. You ready for this? Sure. Also is not going to win me any more popularity points on the internet. But I hope two things for people like that. Number one. I hope you're ashamed of yourself. (laughs) And number two, I hope you stub your toe tonight. The pinky toe. Yeah. Or the big toe. Take your pick. I think the pinky toe probably hurts more. Yeah, you're probably right. The big toe is like, like, dude, it's going to hurt every step you take for the next day or two. Yeah. If you stub your big toe. So, yeah, I hope you stub your toe. (laughs) Any toe. It doesn't matter. I hope you stub the hell out of it too. Not like break it. I don't want you to have like a medical bill, but I I hope you stub your toe real bad. Oh, I, okay. For those people, I would just say <laughs> you go find yourself some Jesus. Get right with the Lord. Yeah. Don't drink truly while uh, driving and taking selfies. Uh, just don't do it. Be a good person. Be self conscious. Be self aware. Yep. You're loved. You're a special human. But get right with the Lord. 
And uh, I got to say, brother, this has been fun. Yeah, it's been a blast, man. We'll I appreciate to, you having me on. Yeah, this will, uh, we'll have to do it some more. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Thank you. See you.